hello everybody and welcome to this video where we are going to go down memory lane i your humble servant and host on this journey i'm going to tell you um some things and we're going to talk about them a lot of the stuff i'm going to be talking about here will probably only hit for people who are at least my age if you're older, you'll probably know all the shit I'm talking about. If you're younger, it might be kind of tricky. And I'm not trying to alienate you guys, but this stuff came up. And it came up because I was hanging out with some people who are a bit younger than I am, let's say. And we were chatting up a fucking storm and everything and doing our thing. And we were talking about music and um, where... I performed and who I played with and when I started playing um, publicly and stuff like that. I went through this whole thing and I was like, oh my God, I totally remember the first acoustic show I ever played. And then I was thinking about it and it's not actually accurate, but it's the first acoustic show I played at a place that like made flyers and had me on their little thing or whatever. So... Um, I, I actually played um, at a school poetry reading. I read a Henry Rollins poem, and I played... Uh, what the fuck is that song? Jesus Don't Want Me for a Sunbeam that Nirvana did on their Unplugged show, because that had just happened. So that was like... That was relevant in 94. I was talking about this show I played... And it was at a place in Tustin, California, called Cafe Milano, I think is what it was called. And the first song I played was a cover of another song that was on MTV Unplugged, but with a different band. It was a song called um, Big Empty by Stone Temple Pilots. And I totally remember, I'm like, oh my god, I remember, like, learning that song specifically to play at that show. And um, it went fine, but I also remember we were all hanging out, like, me and all my friends, before we drove out to Tustin. And I had on um, some, like, corduroy shorts. Like, they were probably, like, green or gray or something like that. And I had on my Etnies, um, triple stitched, man, so your shoe doesn't get tore up when you're doing an ollie. I had these brown Etnies. And I remember the shirt I had I didn't like. I'm like, why did I fucking wear this shirt? And my friend Joe was there, and he had on this white, like, mesh polo shirt. <laughs> Dude, this is so fucking 94 right here, just smacking me in the face. Um, it was a, like a white mesh polo shirt, but it wasn't like mesh, like nylon. It was mesh, like, like knitted or something, but it was like, you could see the holes, you know? And so we traded shirts and, um, I wore that during my performance and we were just talking and when I was talking about, like, corduroy shorts and shit like that, like, the people I was talking to were like, like, that was a thing. And, um, yeah, that was, that was big. And, again, I don't think these people, like, grew up in California. So if you grew up in a... Are you fucking with me right now? If you grew up in a cold place, maybe um, shorts weren't ever, like, a big thing for you. This is going to fucking go on all day. Don't Keep going. Keep turning. Don't come this way. Okay, cool. It's at the end of the block. Okay, whatever. So this whole thing that I'm fucking, like, still talking about, when I was talking to them about all this stuff, it came up like like, who were your, like, influences when you started doing acoustic shit? And I was thinking about it, and I was like, shit. Like, was I only doing acoustic stuff because how popular MTV Unplugged was? Like, was that really the thing? And I was thinking about it, and it 
obviously was more acceptable, but you got to remember too, at this time, like the coffee shop scene was taking off and it was like independent coffee shops. It wasn't like, like Starbucks everywhere. But I will say this back then you used to be able to play shows at Starbucks. I played at a ton of Starbucks. Um, but there weren't Starbucks all over the place. There were still like Dietrichs and um, Natalie's and uh, what were some of the other weird coffee chains? I don't know, but like they had shows and stuff all the time. In fact, up until I guess this would be the early 2000s, I had um, I hosted an open mic night at two different coffee shops during the week. And then um, I was booking the shows for another coffee shop um, for Saturday nights. And sometimes I would do Fridays too, but um, it was mainly Saturday nights. And um, I did that for years. I was thinking about it and I'm like, well, I got an acoustic guitar before I got any other instrument because I was told, I, and it wasn't even one I got, it was like a hand-me-down that I think it was my grandpa's um, on my dad's side who I never met. Um, and I had to learn on that before I was able to get any other instrument. And I got that like in sixth grade. So to let you know what like big acoustic shit was going on when I was in sixth grade, this is hysterical, but, um, when I was in sixth grade, the band Kiss put out an album called Hot in the Shade, and they had a song on it called Forever, and um, it was an, like basically an acoustic song. I think they had some electric shit in it, too, but the video was them sitting around um, playing acoustic, but probably the biggest song, acoustic song, that happened right then in the rock world was um, a song called More Than Words by Extreme off of the album um, Pornography, I think is how you say it. Um, although I, I called it Porno Graffiti forever, but I think it was supposed to be pronounced Pornography, whatever. And I remember around this time too, I was getting into James Taylor and Bob Dylan. So I was listening to a lot of that. And then right around this time, too, I think um, the first Johnny Cash American Recordings album came out that had, like, Delia's Gone on it. It was the first Rick Rubin album he did. And that album, like, it won tons of awards. It's a fucking masterpiece. Um, if you haven't heard the original American Recordings album, go get that. Um, it was it was just so important too because um, all through the '80s, Johnny Cash's stuff had been so overproduced by these Nashville idiots that it just made him sound like a fool, and his sales were shit all through the '80s. When Rick Rubin got a hold of him, he's like, "Dude, I just want you to like play into a four track, just in your living room, and just." just guitar and you play some songs and send it to me and I think he had some songs he wanted him to play too but it, it was just that album changed my life like that was such a fucking good album but uh so there was that and then um I also around this time discovered Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska which like with the exception of maybe like two songs that album is like hands down like one of the greatest acoustic albums ever absolutely love it and then um around this time too i discovered nick drake and the album pink moon and if you are unfamiliar with pink moon maybe i'll put a playlist together of some of these songs that i'm talking about because um yeah fuck it i'll put a playlist together and put it in here or whatever um, these songs were just amazing. And then you had Jewel come out right after that, doing her acoustic shit that was fucking phenomenal. Jewel's first album, I think it's called Pieces of You. 
amazing. So anyway, so these were all the things, and then plus the MTV Unplugged and all that shit. Just a ton of really cool shit was happening. And I didn't find them until later, but there was also a band called Uncle Tupelo. Jay Farrar and Jeff Tweedy ended up splitting ways um, through the 90s at some point. I can't remember exactly when. But um, Jay Farrar started an amazing band called Sunvolt, whose album Trace is one of the best albums of all time. But Jeff Tweedy went on to um, a lot more fame than Jay ever did with a band called Wilco, which I'm hit or miss on. I'm, I'm not a huge fan. But anyway, that's not the point of any of this. This is the point I'm getting at. So when we were talking about... Fuck, I could talk. When we were talking about like what my influences were um i started saying like some of the things we just talked about but then i was like but then people were telling me that i reminded them of different things and they're like oh like who and i'm like oh hootie and they're like hootie i'm like yeah hootie and then one of them was like and the blowfish and i'm like yeah and they're like oh i just never heard anyone call that group just Hootie before. And I'm like, what the fuck are you guys talking about, dude? Hootie was like big as shit. I was never a fan of them, but um, a lot of people said that I sounded like the dude from Hootie. Which I, I guess he would be Hootie. I, I don't know exactly how that works. Um, But yeah, that was pretty funny. And then I'm like, yeah, because like when I started, like people were like, oh, you sound like Pearl Jam or Crash Test Dummies or Hootie or whatever. So basically any dude who sings a little lower, like that's what I got a ton of. Um, but it was just so funny that like nobody knew like really what the fuck I was talking about. And like I remember all of these songs coming out and like when they came out and how old I was and where I was when I first heard them and all this other shit. And I don't know if people do that anymore. Like, I don't know if, because like back in my day, um, you had to like, just sit next to the radio and you were given whatever you got or you watched MTV and got whatever you got, or you could gamble at the fucking record shop and get something that might be shit, but you don't know. So, like, there, like music wasn't... You weren't able to just experiment with shit like you can now. And so I don't know if that makes the, the search that much more important than how it used to be. But so this whole thing got me going. And so, like, one of the people who was here, like, didn't know who the fuck Hootie was, so I... Did the letter cry? I put that fucking thing on. And um, and then through that, like, I just started, like, playing songs and shit. So, like, Hootie and fucking um, Candlebox and Fastball and um, Semisonic and the Gin Blossoms. And, uh, fuck, dude. It was just, like, a ridiculous going through the 90s thing and then I put on all of Nirvana's Unplugged album which I haven't listened to in fucking years and it's great it's fucking great so good um, and then I uh, listened to the whole Stone Temple Pilots Purple album which again is one of the greatest albums of all time and then of course like I did the thing that I always do I can't listen I can't end up listening to Nirvana without listening to Hole right afterwards. Usually, if I'm listening to the first two Hole releases, I'll just go from there into like L7 or um, Bikini Kill or, um, you know, shit like that, like Luna Chicks, uh, Babes in Toyland, that kind of fucking thing. But if I get into Celebrity Skin, I usually go, oh, I need to listen to Smashing Pumpkins now. Um, if you don't know the story behind that, but that's what usually comes up. And so I was like, oh my God, what do I do? What do I do? And I'm like, okay, I'll listen to Celebrity Skin, songs from Celebrity Skin first, and then I'll go into um, the first two albums. Because I love the first two whole albums. Like, um, 
uh, what is it, pretty on the inside and live through this? Is that what they are? I don't know. But, um, oh, they're so fucking good. They're just so, like, angry. It's it's just great. But I'm like, okay, I'm not going to listen to um, what I would normally listen to. So where do I go from here? What's, what's the next step? And so I fucking put on um, Criminal by Fiona Apple. I'm like, yeah, this is where I'll go. I don't, I'm sure she has other songs. I think that's the only song of hers I've ever heard. But the thing with me is the way my voice is when I'm singing, if I'm singing along with shit, I usually can't hit the notes that dudes hit. Female vocals, like I could sing along with those just at a lower octave and it sounds normal. But a lot of male singers, it's really hard for me to find a place where I like to sing it. I was like, oh, I've been a bad, bad girl. And I'm doing the whole fucking thing, right? So that was great. But then, like, that went to, oh, I went fucking deep and hard, dude. That Sunny Came Home song, I can't remember, Sean something. Um, and then I hit like Sarah McLaughlin and Natalie Merchant and 10,000 Maniacs and Paula Cole. And I was just going fucking deep 90s Lilith Fair fucking shit, dude. It was just crazy. And then I, I'm, I'm like, okay, this is getting stupid. So then I listened to the first two Bikini Kill albums um, and then went back to 10,000 Maniacs. So, and then I'm like, okay, like, and by this time I'm alone and I'm drunk and I just want to go to sleep. But anyway, so while I was listening to all this shit, I was like thinking about how things are different now. And it was making me remember like band shirts. Cause like one of like my favorite things to do when I was in high school, there was um, this like really edgy independent record store next to my high school called Bionic Records. And there's one in Fullerton, and um, I don't know if they still exist, but there was one in Fullerton, and there was one in Huntington Beach or Fountain Valley. It was, like, on the edge. And then there was the one in Cyprus um, where I grew up. And um, they had this amazing wall of shirts. So, um, like, anyone who was like me at school, like, that is where you shopped for your clothes. Um, and so like, I was like going, what did I wear? And I'm like, oh yeah, I had a bunch of black flag shirts. Like, um, I remember I had the like light turquoise, my war shirt. Um, and I remember that shirt specifically because I got fucked up one day with my dates and I ended up wearing that to yearbook photo day. Um, and the funny thing is it's probably my best picture out of all my years of schooling, that picture came out, like my face came out really good. And I had a legit smile. I wasn't like like how I am in like every other fucking yearbook picture. But I also had on this like turquoise black flag shirt with like a, a puppet holding a fucking knife. Um, but uh, I also had um, the black jealous again shirt black flag shirt i love that shirt with the i mean raymond pettibone pettibone is one of the greatest artists ever and i fucking love his shit but i had so many black flag shirts because i just loved the artwork on him and like i had this one shirt that was like a bunch of flyers black flag flyers um i had um oh i had the family man shirt and why was i bleeding I don't know. I got blood all over it. Probably got into like a little skirmish or something, but there was blood all over it, which was funny because if you know what the Family Man shirt looks like or the album cover, um, blood would make sense. And then I had the Nervous Breakdown shirt, and that was one of those shirts that kind of went through all my friends, and it was like kind of crunchy. Like it was so fucked up and old and like... I would have it for like a month and then I would let Mike wear it for a month and Mike would let somebody else wear it for a month and then it would come back to me and it would be fucking wrecked. But this is the other thing that's funny too. I could get blood on fucking clothes and shit now and towels and shit and sheets 
and um, I put them in the wash and the blood comes out. Everything's fine. Back then, I don't understand what the fuck was wrong with it. Dude, if you had blood on something, you might as well throw it away. I don't understand how science has like figured out, like, I will destroy blood. I don't get it. So anyway, but then like also like you had your like misfits skull shirt, like everyone needed to have that. Um, your Ramones circle logo shirt, everyone needed to have that. The bad religion um, cross no thing, like my little no thing, everyone had to have that. Um, these are just staples, you know. Oh, and I also had a Nine Inch Nails shirt from the Fixed album that had Wish on it. I really liked that. It was just a blue backwards N. Dude, you got a flat tire, bro. Jesus fucking Christ. Oh, and I remember um, back in the day, so like Ravers and Taggers was like a big thing. And um, L.A. Party Crews. Like a very small amount of people know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but taggers used to get these shirts that like the shirt and they were always like some crazy like maroon or lime green or whatever but it would just be like a plain shirt and then at the very bottom left like corner of the shirt there would be like some drawing or image of like a ridiculous looking tagger guy like with a spray can or something like that or a raver with like I don't know, stuffed animal pants or something like that. And I remember SST came out with a shirt, which was um, Greg Ginn's record label that Black Flag was put out on, with uh, a dude in... I can't remember if the tagger was wearing a beanie. I think the tagger was wearing a beanie. And the guy... There was another guy like with like a baseball bat wearing a Black Flag shirt hitting the... Um, tagger guy over the head fucking hysterical I don't think I had that shirt but I had a friend that had it and I, I always wanted it but then it was like oh you can't you can't mix streams you're not supposed to you can borrow stuff but you can't go out and buy stuff um but uh oh and then like um I had the minor threat shirt the bottled violence or bottled aggression I had that. And then my friend had the original 12 inch minor threat cover. And then the other shirt that got swapped around between everybody was this um, minor threat shirt uh, out of, for out of step with the sheep. That shirt had this fucking smell that you could not get out of it. It was it was a fucking foul. The fabric was really thick, and it was a really crunchy shirt. Like, I don't know if it had, like, plaster or Mod Podge or what on it, but it was just, it was fucking gross. And so, like, one of us would wear it for, like, I don't know, we would have it for, like, a couple weeks, and then just be like, I do not want this fucking thing. That shirt got passed around a ton. But the reason why I was bringing up these shirts and stuff, because of how different everything is, back at this time like there were these George Bush senior shirts and I tried looking up the thing and I couldn't find it anywhere but it was like an illustration very it looked very much like him of him at the podium when he said read my lips no new taxes but the shirt on, on George Bush's face, his mouth was gone and it was a barcode and it fucking said liar underneath. And that was funny. And then there were Clinton shirts that were red shirts with yellow lettering and the C for Clinton was a hammer and sickle. Those were funny. Okay. Everyone laughed about it. It wasn't a big fucking deal. But I feel like now... Like, the way the world is set up, the way America is set up, the idea of being able to do something like that as a joke does not work anymore. Like, you say these things and it's like, this is my statement against the fucking world. You know? It's just like, it's how it is. 
and it, it's fucking crazy. So I just miss that that little bit, that little bit of like, I don't know, there was an innocence about it. And it's funny too, because like we were coming out of the Persian Gulf War and going into the Clarence Thomas, um, Dr. Pepper can thing with Anita Hill and then going into um, affirmative action and then um, obviously the Monica Lewinsky thing. And it's like, God damn, that seemed like such an innocent time if those were our only fucking problems. Fuck, dude. Unreal. Because I remember my parents freaking out. I moved out um, from my parents' house when I was 14. So, um, but I would still see my mom like once a week or something. And I remember her completely losing her shit over stuff. Because, yeah, there were propagandist fucking people because my mom used to listen to fucking Rush Limbaugh all the fucking time. But even Rush Limbaugh, like, fucking Tucker Carlson makes Rush Limbaugh look like Mr. fucking Rogers, dude. Ugh, it's fucking crazy. I just, I miss the innocence of people being able to just like, say what they think without fucking, like, getting into a full-blown argument. And without, like, people going, oh, I'm never talking to you again because you don't believe like I believe. You know, it's like... Ugh, it, it's just, it's so fucked. But anyway, I've been running the liquor here for quite some time, so I'm going to shut the fuck up now. But I'll put that playlist together. I'll probably link it down below. So that would be fun. So remember, um, Preview of a Dangerous Mind came out today. Um, if you want to get in to the Poetic Anarchy crew um, and do all of the shit that Poetic Anarchy has you do, which is like three lessons a week. There's over 60 videos on there now, but like three lessons a week, a live stream, um, your shit gets published. Um and uh, daily writing prompts, which reminds me I have to post the writing prompt for today. And all this shit. And then plus you get like um, a huge discount on my shit that I sell on Etsy on top of it. So um, lots of cool stuff. Lots of cool stuff. But um, yeah, you have until the end of the month to sign up to get this um, lowered price locked in before next month when I up it. So um, that's that. So um, hit the join button down below and join the Anarchy crew. And type hard, everybody. And keep buying my books. And I will talk to you guys later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon, I appreciate the hell out of you guys and thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you could run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.